first, I just want to do a very quick run through the agenda. So we're all on the same page about um, the next two hours together. Um, so uh, after after we're kind of assembled here, we're going to do some introductions, including some uh, welcoming remarks from leadership at from the Department of Environmental Quality and the Oregon Health Authority. And then we'll have an opportunity to meet each other. So at SAC members, getting to uh, introduce yourself um, and a little bit about your experience and background. And you'll also have a chance to meet some of the staff that you're going to be engaging with uh, throughout this work. Um, from there, we're going to give a background on the committee, the regulatory context that surrounds the committee and define some some key terms that I think will be helpful as you start to understand your role moving forward. Um, and, and there will, of course, be time for questions and discussion during that. Uh, after that, I think we're going to squeeze in a, a stretch break um, and then move on to reviewing a draft of the committee charter that uh, you should have gotten last week in your email. Um, and then we'll wrap up by talking a little bit about next steps generally for the committee. Um, I'll note also that uh, moving forward, you're going to be getting correspondence uh, about meeting logistics from uh, Ben Duncan or Angela, who you see on the line. They work for Crimson West, which is a um, public involvement consultancy that is going to be helping us with this process. And we just... Uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, DEQ is running the meeting today, but, but moving forward, it'll be the Kearns and West team, and you're going to have an opportunity to meet them today as well. Um, and then finally, uh, so just so you are aware, the meeting platform is set up such that you all are panelists and participants in the discussion, but there is also an opportunity for the public to watch the proceedings. Um, for this meeting, they're kind of in webinar only mode. They can they can watch us, but they're not active meeting participants. Um, that's probably how it will remain moving forward. But as you'll see later, we'll we'll have opportunity for the public to address the committee about particular topics that, that might be of interest. Uh, and then for those who need it, the closed captioning is also turned on uh, for today's meeting. And you can click on the live transcript button at the ribbon at the bottom of your screen if you if you would like that turned on. So let me stop there, and then before I invite um, Ali Mirzakalui to, to say a few words, I just want to check in with Apple to see if you've had any luck connecting with the other members. It sounds like Jeff Bowles will be joining us soon. Great. Great. And John Vandenberg says he's on waiting, so I don't know what that means. <laughs> hmm. He looked like he was in the chat. Um, there we go. Great, great. And we do have about a, a dozen or so folks um, from the from the public or otherwise interested who are who are watching the meeting as well. So um, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ali. Thank you, Matt, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Matt mentioned, my, my name is Ali Mirzakhalili. I'm uh, the air quality administrator here at uh, EQ. You know, I want to welcome all of the ADSAC members and thank you all for your generous contribution of your, your time. Um, your willingness to share your time and expertise with us as a volunteer is, is incredibly generous um, and, and, and just greatly appreciated um, by me. Uh, my team, and uh, all of Oregonians. Um, I know you're all busy. I know you all have uh, other commitments. So spending this time with us is, is really um, generous and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hugely impressed and it's just not me, the entire team uh, with the expertise that uh, are gathered here. And, and we are very lucky to have you. Uh, you, you all have many, many years of experience, almost decades of, of experience that you bring in um, uh, to us and, and, and uh, directly on the toxicity uh, reference values. Uh, your role is vitally important uh, as we look to evaluate changes to our toxicity values here in, in Oregon. And uh, those values underpin our, our our health-based air quality standards that a program that uh, that we use to uh, protect public health. 
having access to national experts such as yourselves allows us to focus on science um, and, and uh, not be biased in any way. And that's, that's the way we want to proceed here and, uh, and, and proceed with our business of public health, uh, protecting public health. And, uh, you know, with our partners at, at Oregon Health Authority here. Um, so it, it is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, just, I can't say enough to thank you enough to, for uh, lending us your time and your expertise and joining us here uh, in this process. And, and thank you again. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over now to uh, Gabriella. Uh, Thanks, Ali. And hi, everybody. I'm Gabriella Goldfarb. I'm the Environmental Public Health Section Manager at the Oregon Health Authority. And I've um, been in this role for six years. Um, soon after what would um, the impetus for cleaner o o Oregon kind of erupted on the scene in Oregon um, with uh, um, a real crisis of, of public concern. Um, and uh, concerns about actual air emissions um, erupted in the Portland metro area around two glass factories. And there was a big disconnect between what the public thought um, the state knows about what's in our air <laughs> and, um, and what we actually did know um, with the, um, you know, very important, but not um, as comprehensive as people imagined, um, re uh, you know, system of, of regulating, you know, air emissions. It does, uh, you know, we, the Clean Air Act is an amazing success story. Um, but uh, as we found very directly, um, it, it doesn't account as much for the localized um, exposures to neighbors from industrial facilities. And we, for, I, I, you know, as we see across the country, but, and in Oregon as well, we saw chronic conflicts between neighborhoods and facilities. And we didn't have the tools to address those conflicts. And um, you know, don't let a good crisis go to waste. This um, crisis that erupted really was the, was the impetus for um, Governor Brown, you know, calling on the agencies to develop a regulatory framework. And I think some of you followed and were consulted <laughs> along the way as we built the airplane while flying it. Um, to create a, a program that has health um, risk uh, at its center along with community engagement um, as well and transparency and science. And so I wanna echo Ali's um, deep gratitude for the help that you are going to be giving us in this process as we go through this first round of updating the toxicity reference values. Um, you'll meet my uh, t uh, two tox the valiant public health toxicologists in, in my shop momentarily, but um, you know, they with support from, and, and we, we have a great team between our two agencies and it's been an amazing partnership this whole time, but um, they're going to be, they are so grateful for having you all and having a, um, it's been a great team and a great conversation and great support, but having fresh ideas and different perspectives that really can test their thinking and um, and bring other resources to bear on on the thinking is is invaluable. So uh, I want the meeting to get underway, but really really appreciate um, the time and investment that you all are are willing to make in supporting um, us taking this you know pretty groundbreaking program we think um, to the next stage of its of its um, maturation. So. Um, and with that, I am I turning it back over to you, Matt? Yeah, I think so. Thank, thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you both, um, Gabriella and, and Ali. So yeah, I think let's um, let's roll right into some introductions. I think we'll have the agency staff and the facilitation staff introduce ourselves first, and um, we'll move quickly because we're anxious to to learn more about you all and for you all to meet each other. So. Again, um, my name is Matt Davis. I've uh, uh, managed the Cleaner Air Oregon program here at DEQ. All about, um, and I'll, I'll maybe I'll I'll walk down the list. So, <laughs> Apple, why don't you um, go ahead next? Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Apollonia Geckner. I am the program coordinator for Cleaner Air Oregon, um, and please feel free to call me Apple. Thanks. Thanks, Apple. 
and Sue. Hi, everybody. My name is Sue McMillan. I'm in the Technical Services Division of Air Quality, and I was the staff lead for the ADSAC that met from 2014 to 2017. Thanks, Sue. JR? Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm excited to also be here and uh, listen to you all and learn from this process. Uh, I work with Matt and Apple in the Clean Air Oregon program. I'm a program engineer, so not a toxicologist, but um, I do use, uh, I will employ the, the values that uh, you all come up with here. So uh, good to meet you all. Thanks, JR. And I think we'll um, move over to the health authority of uh, Holly and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Holly Dixon and I'm a public health toxicologist at Oregon Health Authority. I'm in the environmental and public health section with Gabriella. And I think that leaves Dave. Um, we can't hear you or I can't hear you. If... How about now? Yep. Okay. I'm David Fair, another toxicologist in the Oregon Health Authority um, in Gabriella's shop, and I work closely with Holly. Thanks. And how about um, Ben and Angela, if you want to introduce your, yourself and a little bit about your background? Sure. Angela, you want to start? Sure. I can go first. Uh, my name is Angela Hesenius. I'm an associate with Kearns and West, and I have a background in environmental policy. Thanks, and I'm uh, Ben Duncan. I, uh, I'm a senior director with Kearns and West. Uh, Matt gave a little intro to, to what we do, but we're a kind of neutral third party objective uh, facilitation team. I'm uh, just really excited to, to share this space with you all. My background, I sometimes tell people I'm recovering from public health. I spent most of my my uh, career in environmental public health, uh, background in environmental science, long history with uh, air toxics work. And um, it'll be nice to be on, on, on this side of the equation and kind of geek out with you all on, on the toxicity conversation outside of all the kind of politics, but focused on the science and the health. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to working with you all and, and uh, seeing what comes out of this conversation. Thanks, Matt. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben and Angela. So yeah, I think we want to use the rest of our time on this agenda item to, to meet you all. Um, kind of, again, you know, each of you uh, submitted interest forms to be a part of this effort, um, and, and we're ultimately uh, confirmed for appointment by our Environmental Quality Commission. Um, but, I, but you haven't had a chance to really meet each other. So I think it would be really helpful if you each just take a couple minutes and talk about your um, your areas of expertise that, that you want to highlight, your um, you know professional affiliation, if, if you're willing to share that, and, and anything else that you think is important for us to know. And then we also have short bio sketches for each of you in the charter that th those were things that you um, provided to us that we only edited for for consistency and, and things like that. So that's also in the charter, but, um, and I can, I'll walk down the list as it appears in the, um, in the participant log for me. And I think that means uh, Jefferson is gonna go first. Sorry to put you on the spot, Jefferson, I know you just joined. We just did some staff introductions. And like I said, we were gonna invite you all to, to introduce yourself. Okay, great. Thank you, and very sorry to be late uh, with uh, you know joining the Zoom call. Um, so my my name is Jefferson Fowles. Uh, I just go by Jeff, and um, I'm a staff toxicologist with the Department of Public Health in Cal in uh, Richmond, California, with the Environmental Health Investigations Branch. Um, and I've been at this job for about eleven years. Uh, so. Before that, I did some work in in Europe for um, for Bayer, um, and then for a company called Lyondell, 
<clears throat> and um, those were about three year stints each. Um, and before that, I worked for the New Zealand government for um, about eight years um, in their Ministry of Health as a toxicologist there, um, doing a lot of risk assessments and environmental health and policy work. And prior to that, I worked for the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment in California um, with the air toxics and epidemiology section. So my, um, my air tox um, experience includes um, work in their um, hotspots program, reference exposure level determinations, cancer potency factors, and um, toxic air contaminant um, summaries. And um, I serve on the uh, Pesticide Review and Evaluation Committee here in California as well. So nice to be with you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think next up is Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica Myers. I uh, was spent nine years as a toxicologist with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Um, developing our own toxicity factors that we use for air monitoring in the state of Texas and uh, how we use systematic review and the development of those toxicity factors. I actually left the state and I'm now currently working for uh, SRC Inc. as a consultant and government contractor, mostly working with ATSDR developing tox profiles. Um, I have experience doing inhalation toxicity factors and risk assessment and uh, I was born and raised in Oregon, so I'm excited to do a little bit of work on this project. Great, thanks Jessica. And I just note that we have all seven members on now, which is a accomplishment in and of itself. <laughs> you all are really busy people. And uh, again, just to, for some of you who joined late, um, just reiterate our really profound thanks for, for your time above all else and your um, willingness to participate here. So um, I think next in the queue is John Boudreau. John, we're just kind of introducing ourselves a little bit about your background. Okay, well, I've been uh, with the uh, California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment for what seems like forever. I believe it's uh, 29 years. And I'm um, chief of the air toxicology and risk assessment section. So we're the section responsible for the hotspots program, which is uh, going to be very close in form and function to what you folks are going to be doing here. So um, that's what I've done for a long while. <laughs> Great, thanks, John. Um, and then I think we have John Stanick. Hi, um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm John. Yep. I'm, I'm John Stanick. Um, I'm with uh, the Hazardous Pollutant Assessment Branch, um, which is part of EPA Center for Public Health and Environmental Health Assessment. Um, I've been with this group for 20 years now. Um, I'm a trained uh, inhalation toxicologist um, from graduate school. Um, over these years, I've, I've helped support or authored uh, several IRIS assessments, um, have provided some regional support um, on the risk assessment guidance documents for the regions, um, as well as authored a few um, RFC review projects within the agency. Um, so yeah, a lot of inhalation work takes up the majority of my time at, at the EPA. Thanks, John. And then uh, to, to round out the Johns, <laughs> I guess John Vandenberg. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here with the group. Um, I'm a adjunct professor now at the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University. I retired from the Environmental Protection Agency uh, after about 36 years, mostly working in risk assessment and related to air quality. I was responsible for many of the assessments in the IRIS program, as well as the integrated science assessments for the uh, criteria air pollutants. And 
I consider myself a risk assessor. I kind of surf across the information and pull the information together to, to apply. Having worked at the science policy interface, really on the science side, but interacting quite a bit with the policymakers as well. And I'm a fellow of the Society for Risk Analysis as well. Thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be a participant. Great. Thanks, John. Next up is Daisy. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. So you see my name, my true name is Chao Xiang, but nobody can pronounce it. So I always go with Daisy. So I'm from the you know, Department of Pesticide Regulation from the Human Health Risk Assessment Branch. And my work is, uh, you know, mainly as a risk assessor. I've been joined DPR maybe since 2016 and almost like, you know, six, six years six years here. So my work here is mainly focused on fumigants. So I have, a, you know, finished one uh, fumigant risk assessment on the software for I. Now I have another chemical called Picron. So I use, uh, you know, quite a bit of all different tools for the inhalation, you know, uh, risk assessment, including PBPK, you know, MPPD. And I also actually work on some gun guidelines for our, you know, department to uh, how to uh, work for the, you know, fumigants, how to come up with uh, uh, different uh, IFCs. So before that, I was mainly, you know, in academia. So I have a very diverse background. So I work with very, you know, different kind of model species. And um, two main research is focused on one is like uh, breast cancer. The other is the zebrafish model. So very, very diverse background, but my, you know, recent focus at the DPR is uh, like a fumigant risk, uh, risk assessment. So, so I'm very happy to be here, you know, hope I can contribute to something. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Daisy. And Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Susan Tilton. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Environmental and Molecular Toxicology at Oregon State University. Um, my background is primarily in molecular and computational toxicology, but our work here um, currently focuses on understanding toxicity of inhaled pollutants um, in various uh, human respiratory and vitro model systems. So happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Susan, and, and thanks again to all of you for the introductions and um, really looking forward to getting to know and work with each of you more as the, as the months go on. So the plan uh, for today now is to pivot a little bit and staff are going to provide you some uh, kind of a short presentation on uh, the background of the committee, as I mentioned, the regulatory context that the work fits into, um, and and a reminder of kind of some of the the plan and um, obligations of the of the committee generally. So I think I'm actually up first on that. Apple, if you can pull up the presentation, that would be awesome. Great, thanks Apple. So yeah, um, I think first and foremost, you probably already picked up on this, but just to, as a, by way of some general orientation, um, you're meeting today with staff from two state agencies here in Oregon, the Department of Environmental Quality, which is the state's agency for um, protecting Oregon's air, land and water, and the Oregon Health Authority, which is our, our sister um, agency responsible for protecting public health among other things. And, um, and we work uh, really hand in hand in a lot of efforts, but it, particularly with the Cleaner Air Oregon program. Um, we're really um, in many ways, just, just one work group. And that is uh, I think by virtue of the program really necessitating expertise, both from an environmental protection perspective and, and uh, toxicology in particular for this and, and health generally. Um, as part of the, the Department of Environmental Quality is organized into three divisions, 
by environmental media and uh, within the air quality division that Ali leads um, sits the, the Cleaner Air Oregon program. And Cleaner Air Oregon is really a, a brand name for Oregon's um, regulations and program for evaluating and regulating risk from industrial air emissions. And uh, for those of you who are, who are here just a bit earlier, you heard Gabriella kind of alluding to the fact that the program is, is somewhat new. Our uh, uh, DEQ is governed by an independent rulemaking body called the Environmental Quality Commission, and, and they first adopted rules for the program in late 2018, so just about four years ago. And um, leading up to that was a two-year public process uh, to design the regulations, and really that came from um, the, the catalyzing force was uh, uh, public crises in the Portland area related to um, kind of a, a, not a realization for many um, that emissions from industrial sources can, can cause uh, public health risk, even when they're operating um, fully within the law or within the bounds of their permit. Uh, and that again, um, for many in the community was the first time that they were realizing that. So the Cleaner Air Oregon program is a complement to Oregon's existing air permitting programs. We, for those of you who have been in the air arena, we implement both federal standards for, for major sources, and then we also have a state level permitting program for minor sources. And um, our uh, air toxics evaluation program, Cleaner Air Oregon, uh, applies to both, both types of facilities. Can you go to the next slide, Apple? I'm going to talk just a little bit more about what exactly Cleaner Air Oregon is. So we generally describe the program around the three R's um, that you can see on the screen. Uh, and, and those are on the left that stationary sources, permitted stationary sources of air pollution have to report toxic air contaminants on a periodic basis. And they report emissions of some 660 odd particular chemicals. And um, of those 660 chemicals, about 250 have toxicity reference values assigned to them. And it's those pollutants that the facility, facilities are required to assess, uh, assess risk against. And our program applies to both new businesses as they are seeking to um, receive a permit for the first time. And then we are the program also applies to all of the existing sources that were in operation at the time of the rule adoption um, based on a call-in schedule that the department has published. So we, we manage at any one time a subset of existing sources that are working through the risk assessment process. Um, after facilities have completed their assessment of risk from their emissions, they have, they have to reduce those risks in certain instances. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here on the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, Bef before I move, I would note that um, really a key tenant of, of the work um, is community engagement. Uh, and that's kind of throughout the lifespan of the risk assessment process all the way through permitting. Yeah, that's the right one. Great. So I mentioned um, the third R being regulation. So after a facility has evaluated their risks, and I should say that evaluation is overseen and approved by the Department of Environmental Quality in a, a stepwise fashion, um, the risks both expressed as excess cancer risk and non-cancer health risks are compared to what we call risk action levels. So risk levels have corresponding regulatory obligations. And on the lowest end, that could mean um, having an attachment to their permit that has conditions specifically designed to maintain their current level of risk. And as risk increases, you can see their obligations um, change including mandatory community engagement or notification to the neighbors of the, um, of the risk assessment results. At a certain level, the department requires the, a demonstration that the best available control technology is being used to manage the, the risk from the facility. 
um, and further escalating in some instances, even if the best available control technology is being used, if you exceed the risk reduction level, that means that the facility is still obligated to find some way to reduce their risk back down to an acceptable level. And these levels are detailed both in administrative rule and in some instances in our state statutes. And then finally, there's also a, a level where um, risk is sufficient that the department requires an immediate curtailment of activities or emissions to um, lower risks back down to an acceptable level. Okay, next slide. So this is just a quick status update on the on the program. I mentioned it's relatively young. The rules having first been adopted uh, almost four years ago. Uh, although although we're a young program, um, we've accomplished a lot. So the the um, image you see on the screen is kind of an attempt to visualize the steps that facilities go through as part of Cleaner Air Oregon and the green. Um, Balls represent an existing facility, a facility that was operating at the time the rules were adopted. And those blue balls are facilities that have entered the state and sought permits since rule adoption. And um, you can see that the new facilities are moving more expeditiously through the process. I think there's a couple, we could talk more about that if time allows, but there's a couple things going on. One, um, we're doing a lot of source testing for existing facilities to understand their emissions profile and particularly for pollutants that they this may be the first time they've had to report on. And for new facilities, there that there is nothing to source test, right? So we're relying on other sources of information to estimate emissions. And the other reason is does our Environmental Quality Commission and the department intentionally set up to evaluate some of um, the most complicated sources, existing sources in the first wave. So those 20 green balls that are at various stages represent um, some of the largest, most complicated facilities in the state. And as you would expect, it takes a while to, to um, really have a comprehensive and accurate assessment of emissions from those facilities before you can even start to model risk out in the community surrounding the facility. So I'm gonna um, hand it over to Holly now, and I should have said our, our plan here was to kind of power through the slides. Um, so Holly's going to talk uh, briefly and, and then Apple, and then we're going to, there will be no more slideshows today and we'll pause for, for questions and discussion from you all. So, um, go ahead, Holly. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. I'll walk us through the next couple of slides here. Um, so this is another version of that slide that Matt just showed you all earlier. Um, and here I'm going to highlight those different lists of those chemicals and those values that are used in the cleaner air organ process. So these lists are all in Oregon administrative rule. And these lists are updated during the triennial review process, which is a process we were just starting for the first time. So first, the priority list, which Matt mentioned, contains contaminants that are considered a priority for investigation in Oregon. So the purpose of this list is to maintain a current and broad understanding of statewide contaminant emissions over time. And as Matt mentioned, for Clean Air Oregon, industrial facilities must report the air emissions of contaminants on this list. And currently, there's over 600 contaminants on this list. And it originated from a compilation of toxic air contaminant lists from California, Washington, and the US EPA. And I wanna mention that DEQ technical staff familiar with air emissions in Oregon are really leading the updates to the priority list. And we don't anticipate that the app stack will play a role in updating the priority list here. Um, but the second list on this slide is the list of TRVs, those toxicity reference values. And TRVs are the amount of an air contaminant that may cause health problems when inhaled, or that corresponds to a one in a million excess cancer risk when inhaled. And we look for TRVs for contaminants that are listed on that priority list. So currently we have 259 uh, toxic air contaminants on the priority list with TRVs. And this is the list, that TRV list, that we're gonna focus on in these APSAC meetings. 
And as you'll hear more about today, the purpose of the app stack is to review and provide feedback on TRVs proposed by DEQ and OHA during this triennial review. And I'll go into some more details and definitions of TRVs on the following slides. Um, but briefly, um, before we move on, I'll also mention these risk-based concentrations or RBCs that you see here. And these are used in cleaner air organ risk assessments. And they're specific to clean air organ, and they're calculated directly from TRVs. So there's an RBC for each TRV. And they incorporate exposure information, like exposure time, uh, frequency and duration, early life exposure factors, and multi-pathway exposure adjustment factors. And they really just streamline this risk assessment process. And we do not anticipate with RBCs that ASAC will be providing feedback on these, uh, rather just providing feedback on those TRVs that directly feed into that list of RBCs used in Clean Air, Air Oregon. And so now let's zoom in a little bit and look at TRVs in some more detail. Perfect. So on this slide, you can see the two primary ways that DEQ uses TRVs. So this first way on here is for clean air organ, the regulatory program that we focused on in this presentation so far. And TRVs are the basis of those RBCs used in these clean air organ risk assessments. And in addition, TRVs are also equivalent to ABCs. And ABCs stands for Ambient Benchmark Concentrations. And these are used to identify, evaluate, and address toxic air contaminant problems in organ airsheds from all sources. So ABCs are intended to be used for reference purposes. And so for example, ABCs are compared to air concentrations from statewide toxic air contaminant monitors. So if we go to the next slide. Here is the start of some TRV specific definitions that are in DEQ's air quality rules. And I know this is basic review for, for you all, but I wanted to highlight these definitions in our first meeting, since I know that these can vary slightly between different federal and state agencies. So in terms of length of exposure for Oregon DEQ's air programs, acute means exposure to a toxic air contaminant evaluated over a 24 hour time period. And chronic means exposure to a toxic air contaminant evaluated over a one-year period for non-carcinogens and a lifetime of exposure for carcinogens. So on this next slide here, um, the definitions for cancer and non-cancer TRVs are also defined in Oregon Administrative Rule. So for non-cancer effects, we're assuming that there's an air concentration threshold. So at or below this threshold, health effects are unlikely to occur. And non-cancer health risk is calculated with hazard quotients. So where the amount of a contaminant in air is compared to the corresponding non-cancer TRV. And our non-cancer TRVs are set so that the hazard quotients are one. So then for cancer, we assume there is no threshold for adverse health effects. And because of this assumption, the toxicity of carcinogens is given as a probability of getting cancer from being exposed continuously to a concentration of one microgram per cubic meter. And this value is called the inhalation unit risk IUR value. And for ease of use and assessing risk in the cleaner air organ program, DEQ converted IURs to concentrations using a target excess cancer risk level of one in one million. So overall, toxic air contaminants here may have a maximum of three different TRVs, one cancer TRV, one non-cancer acute TRV, and one non-cancer chronic TRV. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so here I want to go over the sources of the TRVs that we use in the program. And we use these ones that are listed on this slide in terms of their scientific rigor and methods for producing toxicity information. And the sources listed here, um, I'll walk through really quickly. So the first one in this table is the US Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency. And within the EPA, we're looking at values from the IRIS program and also the Provisional Peer-Reviewed Toxicity Values Program, PPRTV. 
Then we're also looking at California Environmental Protection Agency values. And there we look at values from the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And then the last one on this table is Oregon DEQ in consultation with the APSAC. Also on this slide, you can see some of those examples of how our authoritative sources refer to their TRVs. So for example, you can see ATSDR has minimal risk levels and California's EPA has reference exposure levels. And DEQ is using the term TRV when we're referring to any similarly derived health-based toxicity value that's developed by other agencies. And when TRVs are available from more than one of these authoritative sources, DEQ and OHA selected one. So the general selection process for chronic TRVs was to select the one that was developed most recently. So for example, we'd select one from 2018 compared to one developed in 2010. And then the general selection process for acute TRVs was to select the TRV with the averaging time that best fit our definition of acute, which is that 24 hour time period. So during the TRV review process, starting as soon as the meeting, the next meeting that we have with you all. Um, we're gonna share in detail this process that we have for checking authoritative sources for new and updated TRVs. And we'll also discuss any TRVs we'd like to update that didn't follow this normal prescribed selection process. So next up, I'll turn it over to Apple um, to go over some additional details on the background and purpose of AppSAC, and then we'll take any questions. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Holly. And as she mentioned, I will be going over some of the details regarding the background and purpose of ATSAC. So the ATSAC is a longstanding committee. Um, it was around from 2006 to 2017. And originally, it was tasked with reviewing proposed toxicity information and voting on recommendations for new or updated non-regulatory health-based standards for toxic air contaminants the ones known as ambient benchmark concentrations or ABCs that Holly mentioned earlier. And the first set of ABCs were adopted in 2006 and were the basis for evaluating air toxics trends in Oregon. And later were the basis for certain regulatory values used in the Cleaner Air Oregon or CAO program. The Environmental Quality Commission or EQC um, they, in 2018, adopted CAO rules, and those rules established a regulatory program to require stationary sources of pollution to report toxic air contaminant emissions, assess their risk to neighbors, and where needed to reduce risks. In the air toxics alignment rules, which were adopted last November, November of 2021, DEQ rescoped ATSAC to provide input on future updates to TRVs. So ATSAC will provide scientific input on TRVs that will inform DEQ, OHA, rules advisory committees, and ultimately the EQC, the Environmental Quality Commission. According to the rules, the commission, meaning the EQC, Environmental Quality Commission, recognizes the many scientific uncertainties associated with the effects of toxic air contaminants and the continuing development of new information in this field. An Air Toxic Science Advisory Committee, ATSAC, will advise DEQ on the development of TRVs to be recommended to the commission for use in the state's toxic air contaminant program. The ATSAC will review and provide feedback on TRVs proposed by DEQ. So ATSAC deliberations and advice are limited to reviewing and providing input to DEQ and OHA on the process and science being relied upon to justify revisions to TRVs. The agencies may also seek advice on revisions to RBCs or the priority toxic air contaminant list that Holly had mentioned, but ATSAC will not be deliberating on policy or fiscal impacts of such changes. ATSAC is intended solely as a technical advisory body, not as a committee designed to reflect the values of other interested parties. 
Third party facilitators and agency staff will record opinions and recommendations from all committee members. DEQ and OHA will consider them once reviewed and approved by the members. So that's something to note. Uh, no committee consensus will be required of the ATSAC. Um, and kind of to put it simply, ATSAC is where we're going to just talk purely about the science and the policy implications will come later. So, oh, this is the one we want. Here is a graphic of the rulemaking process and where ATSAC's role is in that process, um, just sort of to visualize what I was just talking about. Um, so as you can see, DEQ and OHA will develop TRV proposals and they will meet with ATSAC for feedback. DEQ and OHA will consider the feedback they receive from ATSAC. And based on that, DEQ and OHA will determine the new TRVs and write them into a rule, and the standard rulemaking process will take place. As I mentioned before, ATSAC will focus solely on the science, not any policy impacts. So you might be thinking, well, when will that take place in this public rulemaking process? Um, the fiscal and policy concerns will be considered later in the rulemaking process with rules advisory committees or RACs or other committees, as you can see here in our little timeline. Um, and ultimately, DEQ and OHA will have the final discussion on the TRV values. And then we'll go to this one. So this slide is expanding upon the TRV rulemaking timeline from the last slide. And this is how we currently envision the series of meetings with you all will happen during this, uh, this TRV review process. We are starting today with an initial meeting to introduce you to the team, the charter, and key terms for the TRV review. There will be a second introduction meeting soon where, as Holly had mentioned, we'll take a closer look at DEQ and OHA's plan for updating TRVs and look at a TRV update tool that staff has developed. Um, there are 259 chemicals and we will talk to you about the specific chemicals that we will like we would like to look at. Um, so that will, you know, after the second meeting, DEQ and OHA technical staff will go off and develop TRV proposals and questions for you all. And this will take several months, and the timing of this will depend on what chemical updates arise. When the initial staff review is complete, DEQ and OHA will meet with you all to review the general processes, the algorithm that agencies followed to generate the proposals. We predict that we will also schedule a series of meetings where you all can take a close look at agency questions on TRVs for specific challenging chemicals. And at the end, there will be a final ATSAC meeting where we we'll capture all of the final decisions and opinions from you all. Um, and I'll go ahead and pause here for a few minutes and the team can answer any initial questions that you have. Thanks. Do you wanna just uh, jump in? I've got a couple questions, is that all right? Uh, first, thank you very much. I think this is very, very helpful. One of the things that isn't very clear to me is, do you have guidance for the staff in terms of how you're developing the TRVs? Do you have like a, a guidance document in terms of how you're pulling information, any systematic review of the literature, the types of information that you're pulling together, and then you're creating, I think it sounds like a chemical profile or some summary of the evidence for a particular chemical that then results in a TRV. Can you just describe briefly how that works and whether we would have that so we could see how you're doing what you're doing? Yeah, thanks, John, for that question. I can I can start start it off. I think it's, at this point, what we're doing is we're developing a written plan and a tool that we're going to share with you at this next meeting for how we're pulling from existing authoritative sources. So how we're going to be scanning and taking information from EPA, ATSDR, and California, and all those existing places that have already developed those TRVs. And so we'll, we're going to put together some documentation for you all to review of how we're doing that, and we'll walk you through that tool kind of just how we're collecting information that's already out there. And then for the second part of that, after we go off 
and see what's out there at these existing authoritative sources. Then we'll go through and see, are there any other special cases where we wanna take a look at DEQ adopting a value with APSAC? And with that, we develop the documentation kind of at that time as the specific cases arise. That's kind of how I'm envisioning that. So we're kind of walking through this process slowly starting with what updates are already out there is that does that help at all or anyone it else does. have anything to add on that so, one? so should we expect to see these in kind of batches or trickling in what are you seeing as the process in terms of having us review things yeah we're thinking about starting with the batches of what are what are the big things that arise like we have this list of chemicals that we went through our update tool that you all previously looked at and these ones have updates according to our regular process that you all um, could provide input on. And then maybe we would have a batch of these ones we updated and they didn't follow that process. And we wanna deviate from that process because of these reasons and we can discuss those. And then I'm hoping, I'm thinking that there'll be a few chemicals where we need a lot more discussion. And those would kind of be like specific meetings we have on a chemical um, to discuss those questions. So kind of, a variety of things. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Um, I may have other questions, but that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Holly, just to I think kind of reiterate what what you said. Part of the reason we can't answer the question perfectly yet is because we are developing this tool to account for changes already occurred by authoritative sources, and we want you to have a look at that tool before we before we hit go and um, start to get a sense of the overall workload. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Matt, I might, if I could, I, I feel like a, a real lay person in, in this uh, esteemed group. I'm, I'm curious around Kind of the, the the language around acceptable level and and how this or if this group grapples with that as part of the TRV ABC discussion or is that a policy conversation? Uh, I think it's if I'm understanding the question right, it's then it's probably a policy conversation. The the level of work that this group will be doing is to understand the concentration in the air of a particular pollutant that corresponds with a you know, with one in a million excess cancer risk or the likelihood that you would experience a non-cancer, um, a non-cancer health effect. And then as a course of um, state law and administrative rule, we have previously prescribed how many excess cancer risks is acceptable. So in other words, this group helps us determine what level of uh, pollutant equals one in a million cancer risk, but other processes have decided that in these instances, we will allow 10 in a million cancer risk before a particular regulatory response um, is, is triggered. So hopefully that, yeah, and I see, and Gabrielle might wanna add to that also. Yeah, and and Ben, as the other major layperson here, and with the with all the smart people, um, I I can relate. Um, and that those were policy; those are just policy decisions that have been made. Um, and um, the legislature uh, during the period that that the DEQ rules were originally being adopted, um, during legislative session, passed a law that. Um, made those policy decisions for some interim periods of time. So setting a cap on how low, for example, um, uh, DEQ could, could regulate uh, facilities. So, and that will change. So for the first decade, there's a certain level at which, um, below which, uh, or above which facilities will be required to reduce after 10 years, the EQC can reset those levels. And again, those are those are policy decisions. So this group here is what does the science say about at what level you see exposure? And the policy was, okay, how much above or below or at that level are we going to restrict emissions if if, if we find that facilities are emitting at you know, whatever level based on this science that that says tells us 
through research or um, you know exposures to animals uh, through animal studies or epidemiological studies um, what we what health effects um, we see or extrapolate to humans from animal studies so um, my toxicologist please correct me and our esteemed um, folks uh, you know but please correct me if I've misstated everything anything but just wanted to lay person to lay person explain my my understanding of it and also if we have members of the public or folks who are following this, this is being recorded um, hopefully that's some helpful context yeah Jeff. sorry about that thank you um, and thanks for the, the really excellent um, introduction to what we're we're looking at and um you know i just from my perspective and experience you know 259 compounds is a pretty big number and i can just imagine anticipate that we'll probably more commonly run across data poor compounds than data rich ones in this entire process which means that we'll um inevitably deal with some non-ideal you know and have to um err on the side of caution a lot of times. I'm just kind of wondering if um, there's any thought given to placing degrees of confidence or, you know, on these values, or are they just all going to be, you know, I mean, I can imagine the EPA does that sometimes um, as a high, medium, and low sort of confidence qualitative rating. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing was um, there's, because there's the 24 hour time point there's going to be a lot of needing to shoehorn um, data into that um, framework and i'm just wondering if the, that's all been sorted out ahead of time or is that something any of the sort of methodological questions that you're going to want the the committee to also address thank you yeah Thank you, Jeff. I can start that one off and maybe Dave too, if you have any perspective on the kind of shorter time periods um, on the TRVs for acute on how it was done in the past. I don't know if that would be helpful, but for your first part about kind of confidence that we have in the data, that's something that I do think maybe would be helpful for us to take a look at of like maybe capturing that in our update tool. Um, if that's already there in the existing authoritative sources. So I'm gonna think about that a little bit more as we go through this and set up that tool. And then I don't know, there's a lot there we can also talk through as we go along with this update process. And exactly for the acute uh, TRVs, they, that's how we don't go with the most recent one for those. We go with the one where the averaging time is closest to our definition of 24 hours. And I think there was some kind of there was an existing hierarchy of how that was done and methodology in the past that I think we'll dig up and provide to you all before the next meeting where we kind of go into that process for selecting those. And I do know it was more complicated. I don't know, Dave, if you have any insight into how that was done before that I might not have. Yeah, I, mean, I think like for overall perspective, I would just reiterate that we're our intent is not to reinvent the wheel as much as possible. So, so where another agency has already made a determination about the right averaging time or the level of confidence in a in a value, we lean on our first choice is to lean on that. So, so the the bulk of these 259, the bulk of the update will be something that will happen kind of with an algorithm that we've developed, like Holly mentioned in the beginning, that will take. If ATSDR and Cal EPA both have a number for the same chemical, we'll take the one that <clears throat> the most recent took the most recent pass at the at the literature review, and we'll just use that number. Um, so, so for the, so a lot of what we'll be asking you about is, in, especially in this next come upcoming meeting, is does our algorithm make sense? <clears throat> like, do you think that the does our algorithm for going through this make sense? And that will cover like the bulk of chemicals, right? And then we'll we'll go and do that, apply that algorithm, and we anticipate coming across some instances where we want to deviate from the algorithm, or there might be some new chemical that none of our authoritative sources have a value. Like, um, we we know of we have, there's a few that we have in mind already that nobody has a number, 
but it might but there's a lot of it in Oregon and we might try to make one so in those cases that those will take a lot more time on a chemical specific basis with the ATSAC like as we come up with the proposal for those instances but um, in general for both of those questions that you ask about our level of confidence in the number and how well a short-term value fits our averaging time um, we kind of are leaning on what's what those authoritative sources have already done to 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 make that call and uh and, and like i say we are our, our 24 hour definition is is in rule and um you know right now we, so we've just sort of our first choice for a short-term value is the agency that whose average in time best matches that or at least um encompasses the 24 hours and then we step down from there so um if it comes up that we have a short-term concern about a, a, a contaminant that, there, that none of our sources have a short-term value for, and we and then we are like looking in literature, doing our own literature review, like that will take probably more than one ATSAC meeting for a chemical, a specific chemical like that. But but I anticipate most of the ATSAC work will be evaluating our algorithm, and then looking at the big list afterwards to just see, and and we'll highlight for you those instances where we felt it was, we needed to deviate from the algorithm. Um, Thanks, Dave uh, and Holly. Um, Jessica? Yes, I, I'm just wondering if you are only limited to that list of sources that you have. So I might be a little biased, but Texas does create these types of values also, and they specifically create 24 hour values. So why is that not something that you would look at? Yeah, thanks, Jessica. That's that's a great point. Uh, there's other resources out there, and all of the these ones are in rule existing, but we also have DEQ in consultation with APSAC as one. So if there are other resources where there are short-term values and lists um, with kind of supporting documentation, um, really would like to receive those resources and any input from you all on what that could look like if we want to explore um, TRVs on other lists and discuss that as a group. I'd be interested in seeing, in seeing that. I'll jump in and just say, because, um, because that's already in rule, that DEQ adoption is the pathway for bringing in other, um, any other information. So just to, to clarify. Other questions uh, um, from this uh, kind of introduction <laughs> presentation? Yeah, John. So I'm looking at the, uh, the toxicity reference value list, uh, table two, which has the, the TRVs for chronic cancer, chronic non-cancer, and acute non-cancer. And I think this is the one list that is 247 or something like that chemicals. So if I understood from the beginning, there are another couple hundred, several hundred chemicals that aren't on the list at this point, but that's a separate process than, than what we will be asked to do is to be involved in that. Is that correct? Uh, largely, yeah, I think that's correct. We haven't necessarily ruled out that we wouldn't bring to this group some conversation about changes to the priority list. That's the other list that has reportable chemicals right um but generally speaking yeah that's that's an accurate understanding okay thank you holly anything you you want to add there holly um yeah i think i think what i'll add is there there'll be a tool for updating the 260 trvs that we already have where we'll look for updates but then there'll also be a process in the tool where we're going to look for new trvs on that priority list that we don't currently have TRVs for. So we're looking to add new TRVs as well as update the existing ones. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other questions? Um, great, well, this was a good, uh, good discussion, very good questions. Um, so we're at we're at four ten. We scheduled to go until five. We had a ten minute stretch break. Stretch break. Excuse me. In the agenda, um, I think I just want to take a quick 
pull from ATSEC members in particular, if you want to take that break, or I know it's it's late for some of you, so I also just if, if there's interest in <laughs> plowing through, we can do that. But um, but we did say we would take a stretch break here. So any strong feelings one way or the other? You have our attention. I'm ready to keep going, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Okay. If you have permission to turn off the camera and do your <laughs> yoga stretches yeah. or yeah. whatever you need to do. Absolutely. Please take care of yourself as as you need to um but yeah we can we can plow through here and we covered a lot of ground uh already so i think the next um agenda item is to review the draft charter and i'm going to walk us through that at a pretty high level um you received it like i said in your in your email about a week ago and you also were not going to be taking any kind of action on the charter today. The primary request is that you do take a look at it um, over the next couple weeks. And if you have specific questions or concerns about the language you see that, that you notify us and that we'll bring a, a final draft to the group um, at our next meeting. So um, I'm gonna, and then there's a couple particular points in the charter here that we do wanna, we do wanna make a point to talk about today. So. Apple, are you willing to pull up the charter? Um, I'll just have it on the screen while we walk through it here. So the first section is um, really purpose and I think some background on the committee, which, which we just covered in the presentation, but um, is documented here for, uh, for posterity. Um, so nothing, nothing you haven't seen or learned here. Again, the purpose of the committee is to advise the department on potential revisions to toxicity reference values. And, and a note that the committee, um, while recently kind of reconstituted with the revised scope, some version of this group has been around for uh, for almost 20 years now um, with, with kind of off and on um, engagement, depending on the department's needs. So you can scroll down, Apple. Um, so yeah, here's a, a good area. Again, I'm not going to read it bullet by bullet. You can, you're welcome. You'll have time to do that. But really, an articulation of what the roles are for the agencies, um, DEQ and the Health Authority, um, which are to to come prepared to equip you all with the information um, you need to advise us and, and have access to the information that we are relying on for with our to make kind of preliminary recommendations and to to make sure we are preparing in, in consultation with the third party facilitator, um, good good process to, to elicit robust conversation. Uh, that's, that's really the purpose of the, the group. Um, uh, ben and, and Angela as the facilitation team are moving forward, we'll really be managing the, the meetings themselves. We'll be working with them on, on agenda design and things like that. But, but they're really going to help us move through the material and um, and and assure that we're having open, candid, and and robust conversation. And that's going to be particularly important given that um, you all are not a decision-making body necessarily. So some of the more we're going to need to dig deeper than just some more traditional tools like a simple majority <laughs> vote or something like that. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. And then the, the roles for the committee members, at least as we described them in this draft, are to, um, to uh, you know, attend the meetings throughout the process, totally understand there's going to be scheduling conflicts, and, and we will accommodate that. We'll want to accommodate um, making sure you can participate uh, in whatever way makes sense. The rules say that you serve a three-year term. Um, we're not sure that totally fits the, the model here, but what, what we're really seeking and what's most important to us is a commitment to, 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 to see it through for this first triennial review, which we anticipate to um, happen, you know, beginning now and probably through the next calendar year, although there'll be periods of time where there really aren't meetings um, because we're doing, doing staff work and, and preparing materials for you. Uh, and then, of course, to to, to come ready with 
you know, with your own thoughts and uh, and review of materials to to share with us. Um, can scroll down. The committee membership is you all, and we had an opportunity to um, for you to introduce yourself earlier today. If if there's anything you think is mischaracterized in these bio sketches, definitely flag those for us, and we'll we'll uh, fix them. So uh, <laughs> probably the most important part of a charter here is is blank. Uh, it's the what we're calling the operating principles, and that's that's intentional. Um, that is part of the work that uh, that Kearns and West is is being paid to do is to help us develop those operating principles, and um, and they're going to do that um, primarily by taking a, a a starting draft that the agencies have prepared, and then talking with you all individually. Um, ben and Angela will be reaching out to for a about a 45 minute meet and greet with each of you with the, the agency and no one else present, just an opportunity to meet you and hear your questions and talk specifically about these principles. And then we'll come back with a, a final draft for you all to review. Um, I think it's gonna probably look like a, a blending of um, some traditional meeting ground rules, but also you know a, a framework to, to kind of assess the level of agreement that there is among the committee on any particular topic. Um, and, and we'll want to be and intend to document that really carefully. So in the instance that there are um, minority opinions or, or, or less agreement on a particular topic, that's, that's something that we're going to want to both draw out in the conversation and also, um, as I said, document in meeting summaries so that information is available for the departments and the, and the commission down the road. Uh, ben, anything you want to add there or are thinking about? No, I mean, I, well, I think the only other thing is just, you know, as a facilitation team, we'll also be asking you kind of what works best for you in terms of kind of sharing space and coming fully prepared to, to the conversations, et cetera. So um, looking forward to, to connecting with folks, getting to know you all a little bit better, as Matt said, uh, uh, you know, aligning on not just how we're going to be in the room together, but how we as a facilitation team can best serve. Uh, your interest. Great. Thanks, Ben. Um, there's some language in here about conflict of interest. You all filled out a conflict of interest or, or lack thereof disclosure when you applied to be on the committee. And under um, under state law administrative rule, this group cannot have any actual or potential, members of the group cannot have actual or potential conflicts of interest. Um, and the uh, that is an obligation that each of you kind of carry as part of being on the committee. And we're going to ask that if that if that changes in the course of your membership, that you notify us um, as soon as possible. And we'll also, you know, intend to have some periodic um, prompt to make sure we're kind of staying on top of that as a group. That's a that's something that the department needs to be able to demonstrate to our commission and to everyone else that we we upheld that um, that part of the uh, of the law related to AppSec. And if you have questions about what that what that means, or you want to talk through a scenario down the road, um, again, just just don't don't hesitate to reach out to us, and and we can we can help you through that process. Um, scrolling down, it's just a department commitment to make sure we have materials for you available in advance of meetings. The, the standard of practice at DEQ is generally two weeks before um, advisory type committee meetings that we make materials available to you and to the public. There may be instances where we want you to have even more time than that, given the, the level and depth of, of review that might be required. But this is, this is where we are kind of committing to to do our best there. Um, and also note that we're going to be preparing and publishing meeting summaries too. And, and all of meeting materials, summaries, all of that is posted on DEQ's webpage for the public to access throughout the process. Um, next section, this, this is very loose, as we've talked about. It's somewhat difficult for us to predict the number and cadence of meetings just yet. But we do think after we have your thorough review of the update tool and then have had some months to review the results of, of the screening tool that 
we'll be able to lay out a more certain schedule for you where we can articulate uh, which batches of, of pollutants or particular chemicals we're going to ask you to review and and when. Um, just, just like today, all the meetings are going to be open to the public to, to view. They're going to remain virtual throughout the course of the process. Um, and we do expect and, um, and intend to create opportunities at the end of the meeting for public participants to speak to the group. Um, and, and we'll be careful to make sure that public understands that this isn't necessarily the time to inform final agency actions that kind of happens during the rulemaking phase, but we still find it valuable um, that interested interested members of the public can, can kind of offer reflections to you all as, as the official advisory committee. Uh, public records and confidentiality, all, all of your interactions with the agency are going to be subject to public records requests. Um, it's kind of disclaimer there. Um, and maybe scroll down a little bit more. I think that's 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 the the bulk of the the substance there. And um, Apple will remain your primary um, agency point of contact. Uh, and then you'll also, as I mentioned, start to get communications from the Kearns and West team also. So I think we can pause there. Um, see if anything stuck out to anyone right now. But but again. Um, know that you're you have a, a few weeks here to sit with that document um if you have questions or feedback please send it our way and um and you'll have an opportunity with ben uh, and then later as a group to really talk through some draft uh operating principles so yeah any any initial questions on that document or the or the process to finalize it Yeah, John. Um, it's not really a, a question, it's really a comment. <clears throat> I appreciate the um, part about supporting materials. It's just a comment that it would be very helpful when you have um, different, link, like table two of Oregon administrative rule 340-247-8010, if you could hot link those, because I'm kind of, as we're going through the meeting, I'm searching for things and I'm having a little bit of trouble finding some of the things like the risk-based concentrations in this 342-45-8010. So it would just be helpful. I think you've done that in several places here, but it's just a comment that hot links are really helpful for being efficient for our time, I think. That's a that's a great flag. And um, yeah, we'll we'll make sure the final version of this and, and subsequent materials has links to things that are available online. Um, okay, thank yeah. you. I've been digging through the Oregon. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have it bookmarked already, John? The <laughs> I, table two of, I, should get, I should get paid double for doing that, digging through this thing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, uh, please don't do Same that. Same triple. Same yeah. triple. Oh, triple. Okay, there you go. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, we'll make sure we, we embed the links uh, moving forward. So so thanks for, thanks for that. Any other questions, comments on the on the charter? Great. Well, we probably made the right decision to just plow through them. I think we're kind of in the home stretch here for the um, today's meeting. I do think we want to just take a second and talk about upcoming meetings and and schedules. I think I, I mean, but I think we've kind of made and discussed our key point, which is our next step is to find, uh, with the help of Kearns and West, <laughs> an opportunity for you all to convene. Potentially in December, um, we we need to do a little bit more internal conversation in, in, regarding whether we'll be ready. And then there's the added complication of that being a uh, particularly challenging time to, to to find time that works for everyone. Um, but in in short, we hope to meet in the next um, in the next couple months and walk you through that tool, that algorithm to evaluate uh, updates that have been made to the TRVs by authoritative sources. That will be your first really substantive meeting where we're going to present process and information to you and, and look to, to get your feedback. Um, and then it's likely we won't 
we won't meet again for a while um and and in the in the course of that time we'll we'll be running the tool and um really thinking through what we want to bring to you for discussion so a flag that we're going to have another meeting here well hopefully in the in the near future and then things will probably go quiet and then it'll pick back up again um hopefully in late winter or um early spring uh, of 2023 uh and um we will uh as as we did for this really endeavor to find time that works for everyone i'm thrilled we got all seven folks on the line today um and 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 part of our and and that's a commitment you know we'll make moving forward to do our best and and um ask for your uh <laughs> diligence in responding to to doodle polls and and those kinds of, of tools quickly so we can we can try and pin things down um you know as quickly as we can i want to be respectful of your schedules and, and time okay I don't think there's anything left we really wanted to review with you today. Um, we will, you have the, the draft charter. Um, we'll look for any feedback over the coming weeks from you on that. You should also expect an email soon from Kearns and West looking to find a time to meet with you individually for about 45 minutes. Um, and in the, in the meantime, also some work to try and pin down scheduling for the next meeting. Um, and we'll also obviously be in touch before the next meeting with all the materials and um, questions we'd like you to be thinking about in, in preparation for the meeting. Anything uh, that the team here at the agencies want to add before we adjourn? So Matt, I just want to once again thank everybody um, for uh, you know hanging in here with us. I appreciate your input uh, and 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 really they are uh, loaning us, lending us your expertise and and your time. And I want to thank my team for you know uh, you know putting their shoulder into this and and doing this important work. And Gabriella um, and Holly, David, all of OHA uh, friends here. Thank you again. Uh, for partnering with us here. This, this is, you know, crucially important work and I really appreciate it. And I look forward to see what we come up with. Great. Great. And I'll just say ditto from OHA's perspective so that everybody can get off the, off the Zoom sooner. <laughs> Always good to under promise and over deliver, right? <laughs> so um, thanks again for all your time. You all have our contact information. If anything, if you have any questions after we, we finish today, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to work with you all. Maybe give them one last minute, Matt, see if there's any, any last yeah, any, thoughts. Any final questions, questions? thoughts? Team, you answered all the questions. Way to go. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Have a have a wonderful evening and um and we'll be in touch soon. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.